Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You've likely heard their names, but do you know the whole story? The true story? Did you know there was a fourth man in that fiery furnace with them? Who was he? Welcome to Through the Bible. I'm Steve Schwetz, and I'm glad that you're here for our study with our teacher, Dr. J. Vernon McGee, because today we're in Daniel chapter 3, verse 3, where Dr. McGee explains the miracle God is about to perform. But before we start, let's listen to Dr. McGee's introduction about the times of the Gentiles and the coming Antichrist. Now, last time we concluded our study of that great image that Daniel saw, and it was the dream of Nebuchadnezzar. He first saw it, and Daniel probably dreamed the same dream and then was able to interpret it to this man. It's an overview of world history, and it'll be back before us again when we get to the seventh chapter of Daniel in a different form, however, in the form of wild, ferocious, carnivorous beasts. But here we have seen a tremendous picture that spans all of the times of the Gentiles. We're living in that today. Now, I have said repeatedly that the church has been given no signs whatsoever. It's been given a sound. We are told that the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. May I say to you, we're listening for a voice. We're not actually looking for signs. But definitely, we're living in the times of the Gentiles, and we're living at the time when the clay and the iron are being mixed together. And we're seeing today certain outward signs that make us believe that we are moving close to the end because of the setting of a stage. And I mentioned last time something that I considered very important. A philosophy has pervaded the world today a philosophy that's rooted in evolution. Modern psychology is also moving us toward the day when we will have the appearance of this man of sin. Everything seems to be moving in that direction, but this psychology that's abroad, that's moving us toward that day, is the antithesis, actually, of God's psychology. And I'd like to share with you today an editorial that I wrote, and it's on the subject of Me Too. Let me read this. I have headed it with Romans 12, 3. For I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. Paul placed great emphasis on the fact that a believer is a member of a body in which there are many members with varying degrees of function and performance. For as the body is one and hath many members, and all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. Now that's what Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 12, 12. The Christian is to function in the body as a member of the body. For the body is not one member, but many. Paul says in the 12th chapter, verse 14, this means that he or she is to function in unison with other members. The believer is to put others first as he functions as a member of the body. Paul says in Philippians, the second chapter, verse 3 and 4, let nothing be done through strife, or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Now, again, the goal and purpose 
is not for the development and glorification of self, but for the growth and development of the body. And again, Paul says in Ephesians 4, at verse 14, that we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of man in cunning craftiness, whereby they lie and wait to deceive, but speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things which is the head, even Christ, for whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth according to the effectual working in the measure of every part maketh increase of the body into the edifying of itself in love. This type of thinking and reasoning cuts across the grain of the popular philosophy of self-fulfillment propagated by Abraham Maslow and others. This ego-centered mentality penetrated the ranks of the evangelicals, Many seminars on marriage were conducted on the basis of this premise. This approach to marriage may explain the reason that divorce continues to escalate among us evangelicals. Dr. Amitai Elziomni, in his new book, states that this ego-centered mentality is responsible for the erosion of the family, the schools, and even of the individual. During the 60s, this deadly philosophy entered the church. The individual must have freedom to express his ego needs of self-fulfillment expressed in sensation and excitement. All of this is done at the expense of the home, the church, and society in general. This ego-centered mentality is destroying the harmony of the home and crippling the church. It also gives the individual an elusive view of self. It leads to pride and self-conceit. This is a mad hatter world we're living in today. And the great words of the past, like conviction and courage and commitment and virtue and discipline, have entirely slipped from our vocabulary. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity that we have to study your word Help us to hear the message that you have for each one of us and help us to apply what we learn from the life of Daniel to our lives today. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Now here's Through the Bible with Dr. J. Vernon McGee. Now today, friends, we come back to the third chapter of the book of Daniel. And in this chapter, we see heathen pride is judged. This man, Nebuchadnezzar, made a very large image of gold. God had told him he was the head of gold, and he felt compelled by pride to move in this direction instead of being humbled by the fact God had elevated him. And so he makes this image that's about 90 feet tall, put it out on the plain of Dura, and called together all the leaders, all of his officers in his entire kingdom. And the dedication took place when all of these governors and captains and judges and treasurers and councils and the sheriff and all the rulers of the provinces, they came. Now I want to begin reading here at verse 3, for this is the dedication. Then the princes, the governors and captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs and all the rulers of the provinces were gathered together unto the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. And they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. You see, now the day of dedication had arrived, and all were present, though Daniel was absent. And we believe there's a good legitimate reason. He was away on state business. He's now actually a man in a unique position of being the chief advisor of the emperor of Babylon, the man that's the world ruler now, the king of Babylon. And so at this dedication, the sight of this image of gold on the plain of Jura was very impressive. And it was as impressive, by the way, as an Atlas missile on a launching pad down in Florida. And it made a tremendous appeal to the eye. 
And now I'm reading at verse 4 now of chapter 3. Then a herald cried aloud, To you it is commanded, O people, nations, and languages, that at what time ye hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, dulcimer, and all kinds of music, ye fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king hath set up. And whoso falleth not down and worshipeth shall the same hour be cast into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. Now, this is the dedication service, and we talk today about freedom of worship. They knew nothing about it then. At a particular time when the orchestra is playing, and they had there, if you'll notice, this orchestra, and I'll say a word about it, and the fact of the matter is there's no room here for spontaneous and personal religion. This is something that's all prearranged, and everybody's to go down on their face the minute that the orchestra sounds out. And if you'll notice the different instruments they had, they had the sound of the cornet, that's a woodwind instrument, and a flute, that's a wind instrument, and a harp was a stringed instrument, and a sackbut was a trombone or a high-stringed instrument. It's difficult to tell. Psaltery was a stringed instrument like the harp, and the dulcimer was a drum with strings above and played with a stick. And then it says all kinds of music. And that indicates that all of the instruments and types of music are not really listed here and that probably there was more in the orchestra. Well, I've given this orchestra a name. It's called the Babylonian Beboppers, or the Babylonian Beatles, or the Royal Rock Quartet Plus Two, or how many more instruments there was there. You can add to it just as much as you want to. And maybe we should call it the Chaldean Philharmonic Orchestra. I don't know, but be that as it may, this was more than a dedication. People were forced to worship. Although true worship is an expression of the heart, it cannot be forced. They went through the outward form. The appeal of the music was to the flesh. You see, music that's spiritual is a wonderful aid to worship. And believe me, in our churches today, that is in many of them, It's very difficult to tell the difference between spiritual music and worldly music. And Paul has a great deal to say about the importance of music for the believer in worship. He says in Ephesians 5, 19, and by the way, this was for spirit-filled believers because after he gave the instruction, be filled with the Spirit, he says, now speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. And in Colossians 3.16, he says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. But you see, at the very beginning, music got off to a bad start. It was mentioned first in the godless line of Cain. And way back in Genesis 4.21, his brother's name was Jubal. He was the father of all such as handle the harp and organ. That is in the genealogy of Cain. You see, when music or ritual appeals to the flesh, it degrades man rather than elevates him, and it's not an aid to true worship. Now, I've been a pastor for a long time. I have had music that might lifted the service. It helped the minister, and it was spiritual, and it was a great blessing. But I have also been in a service when you have music that absolutely nullifies the spiritual worship. It cancels it out. It deadens everything. I remember quite a few years ago holding meetings back east in a certain place. 
and it was a very fine church, and right before I was to give the first message, well, they called on a young lady to sing. Well, I'd never have seen such a showman as that girl was, and she didn't have much to show, by the way, as far as music was concerned. She couldn't sing too well, and she picked a song that had nothing to do, really, with worship, but gave her an opportunity to show off her voice, which, again, as I say, wasn't too much. And I never had such a deadening beginning of anything, so much so that after I said a few words of introduction, realizing how dead it was, I suggested we sing another hymn, and we did, and that helped out a little. And I suppose the people thought, my, this preacher that's coming here to preach, he certainly doesn't have very much to say or much for us. Well, I must confess that I might have been guilty, but the fact of the matter is it's too bad that that girl was used to sing. I asked the preacher about it. In fact, he apologized to me about it, and he made it very clear that she was the daughter of one of his leading officers and that it was customary in that church to always let her open any new meeting by singing. And I've often thought since then, I wonder how many meetings that poor girl wrecked. May I say to you, music can be helpful or not. And the world of music has a tremendous influence on people today. And it's gotten into many services in our churches. Thank God there are many ministers standing against it today. Now, the thing here is that there's to be a terrible penalty if anyone here refused to worship. And this music, I'm sure, helped to prepare them for worldly worship. And the fact of the matter is, you can be sure of one thing, that everybody in that crowd went down on their faces with the exception of three young men. Now let me continue to read at verse 7. Therefore, at that time, when all the people heard the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psalter, and all kinds of music, all the people, the nations, and the languages fell down and worship a golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. Now, this movement of dedication was an act of worship, and it was practically unanimous. There may have been many who were not convinced in their hearts, but they gave no visible evidence that they were contrary. They attempted to justify their positions, I'm sure, of compromise by some form of rationalizing. That's generally the way the people do today. Man was telling me that the reason that he continued in the church that he did, it's a liberal church, he's supposed to be sound, he said that his father had been a leader in that church and that his father had been an outstanding layman when he died, they had a stained glass window there dedicated to his father. He felt like he couldn't leave the church. Well, anybody uses that kind of an excuse, that's rationalizing. And I would say that if it came down to a stained glass window, I'd tell him that I'd put him in another one and I'd take that one out, take it with me wherever I went. Because, friends, that's actually a very unfortunate reason. Now will you notice that we come now to the accusation against the three Hebrew children for failure to worship the image. Now there were three men there that apparently didn't bow. Verse 8, Wherefore at that time certain Chaldeans came near and accused the Jews. Now the king apparently had appointed observers to note any irregularities in the service. And the designated certain Chaldeans may indicate that they had been watching here these three. And they may have been jealous, or they may have had some personal animosity toward them. The only Jews who were involved, of course, were the three Hebrew children, because they were among the officers of Nebuchadnezzar. Now, Jews in captivity who had not any position of leadership, of course, they were not present at this meeting at all. Now will you notice, and I'm reading now verses 9 through 12. 
they spake and said to the king Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. Thou, O king, hast made a decree that every man that shall hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, and dulcimer, and all kinds of music shall fall down and worship the golden image. Let me pause right there a minute. This is the third time we've been given a list of this orchestra. It must have been a very famous orchestra in that day, and that's the reason I call them the Babylonian Beatles. They were there playing this, you know, rock music, getting people ready for the worship of this image. And now they're mentioned to us again. Now we're told here, and whoso falleth not down and worshipeth, that he should be cast into the midst of a burning fire furnace. There are certain Jews whom thou hast set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have not regarded thee. They serve not thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. You see, their accusation before the king was very formal and According to protocol, they made a direct charge against the three Hebrew children by name. There's no misunderstanding as to whom they meant. Now, their charge was accurate. Their insinuation, these men, O king, have not regarded thee, that was absolutely false. Their refusal was not an act of disloyalty to the king personally. It was a recognition of a higher power. They were obedient to their God as is revealed by their answer. Now notice verse 13. Then Nebuchadnezzar in his rage and fury commanded to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Then they brought these men before the king. Notice what it says about Nebuchadnezzar, his rage and fury. Now this man had a problem and a real psychological problem, and we'll pick that up in the next chapter. But I call attention to this. It characterizes his form of insanity. He suffered from, as we shall see, hysteria. And it's a sort of a manic depressive psychosis. One moment they're hot with anger and the next minute while they're laughing their head off. Now we have here the declaration by the three Hebrew children of the power of their God in refusal to worship the image. And I'm going to Read now verses 14 and 15. Nebuchadnezzar spake and said unto them, It is true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, do not ye serve my gods, nor worship the golden image which I have set up? You see, Nebuchadnezzar asked them if the charge is true. Have they refused to worship his gods and the image which he set up? Verse 15. Now if ye be ready, that at what time ye hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psalter, and dulcimer, and all kinds of music. It would go again. That was sure some famous orchestra. Ye fall down and worship the image which I have made. Well, but if ye worship not, ye shall be cast the same hour into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. And who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? Now he gives them another opportunity to change their mind and fall down before the image. You see, their submission now would be a worse reproach than it would have been at the outset. He recites again the penalty for refusal, and he shows the fallacy of it. Now, the king has heard of their God before, and he assures them that he's unable to deliver them. Now, verse 16 Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered, said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. Here we start out again with that expression. The thought here is, O king, live forever. But they left off that. And they said, we are not careful. Means that they have carefully weighed the consequences for refusing to obey the king. They've counted the costs and they're not being careful in giving an answer about it. They uh, very carefully considered the cause. Now, the wise men in Babylon would have advised them to fall down and worship. 
But God had told them, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. Thou shalt not bow down thyself unto them, nor serve them. And they're obeying God here. Well, what's going to be the outcome? Well, we're going to have to wait till next time, friends, to see what the outcome will be. And then we'll continue to move on in the book of Daniel. So until next time, may the Lord richly bless you, my beloved. Once again, Dr. McGee left us on a cliffhanger. So if you want to know what happens, read ahead in your Bible, and then be sure to be here tomorrow as we continue this fascinating section of Scripture. Until then, if we can help you find a Bible study resource by Dr. McGee, call us at 1-800-65-BIBLE or visit us at ttb.org. I'm Steve Schwetz, praying God richly blesses you as you walk with Him today. We're so grateful for the faithful and generous support of Through the Bible's partners who are being used by God to take the whole word to the whole world.